Hey firecrackers, it's Naomi and welcome to the firecracker department. Okay, here we go. This is big people. This is our 150th episode. episode. Can you believe it? Can you believe 150? It just went by like a snap. It feels like yesterday when I sat down with Jane Eastwood, who was our very first podcast guest. And then after that, it was Annie Murphy. And I have to tell you, I used to do so much research. I mean, I still do a lot of research, but I was so nervous starting this podcast. I didn't know what I was doing. Some of you might say, she still doesn't know what she's doing. But I was so scared. I would meditate for each podcast. I mean, I could probably quote lines from Jane Eastwood's sketches in SCTV and recite various lines from the Plateau series that Annie Murphy did. I was so in it. And I'll tell you something, I haven't changed. I just think I've gotten more, I don't know, like my muscles are just more limber. I feel really lucky to be on this journey and to have the support and belief of everybody in the core team. Okay, here's a little backstory. So originally Carousel Pictures, who is Tyler Levine and Katie Curcio, reached out to me and they said, hey, we, we know you as an actor. Have you ever thought about hosting a podcast? And it was so weird because I'd been thinking about hosting a podcast. And so again, it just kind of came together so perfectly. So they supported the first few seasons as we got cracking with the episodes. And then when Firecracker Department burst into a community, we went our separate ways amicably because it was bigger than what they originally planned. And so the way the community came together was I had been doing the podcast and every once in a while a friend would reach out like Anna Gustafson or Joe Boland or Rachel Wilson. They would say, you know, I see this podcast and if you ever want any help with it. So I said, sure, let's have a little, I don't know, like a wine and cheese and talk about the firecracker department and see what it could become. So a bunch of us met over at the Second City Training Center in Toronto and that included Ingrid Hamilton, Veronica Martin, Jen Pogue, Jesse Gabe, Christy Nickel, a bunch of other amazing people and uh, and you better believe I had snacks. I had like gummy bears and cheesies because I was like, you know what, if I'm going to get snacks, I'm going to get two of my favorite things, gummy bears and cheesies. This is kind of what happens when you start your own party. You're like, how do I want my party to be? <laughs> I bought a box of white wine. I was also on my bike, so I had to be realistic about what I could carry. A box of white wine. And I wasn't going to do any styrofoam cups because I was like, I'm not doing something that is completely environmentally cruel. I'm going to do paper cups, the only paper cups that they could have. I'm going to do mugs that were at Second City or I'm going to do paper cups. And the only paper cups that I could find were these little tiny Dixie cups. I mean, they were like, you know those cups that you use for mouthwash? They're basically like that. And that's gone down in history as the first meeting we had with those Dixie cups. I mean, gosh, I stand by it. But we just had this meeting. I remember walking away from the meeting and just vibrating with possibilities of what this community could be. And I felt from the very, very beginning that we were on the precipice of something really cool. And I feel like we are living that. I feel like we're growing all the time. We are learning. We are becoming an important part of our film and TV community and it's because of the core people that believe in what we're creating. And you know, I always say that friends come along for a long time, a short time, or an important time. And so some people have joined Firecracker Department Corps for a really short time, but it was important and it was integral and they left something of huge value. And then some people are still with us, like Veronica Martin, who's the head of our mentorship department and one of the actioneers. So watching Firecracker Department develop and take these strides forward like I knew when Winnie Wong joined us that that was a huge stride forward I just knew there was something magical about Winnie Wong that made me go oh this is going to change the way we work in a positive way and it's gonna lift us up in such a positive way and then putting together the actioneers with Kathleen Harkwell again Veronica Martin Pau Carranza AJ Edmonds and of course Winnie Wong I mean, having actioneers that are sort of my sounding board, that was huge too. It's just been these big, big steps. Having somebody like Sydney Nielsen step in and help us get our social media going and our brand awareness, that was huge. 
And now having folks like Vicki Breyer, who reached out from the UK and said, hey, do you ever think about starting a chapter in the UK? And so now Vicki does all our graphics along with Alyssa Abler, who put our website together. And we wouldn't be able to do all of this without all the bits and pieces of everybody's support. You know, with Emily Churchill from LA doing the wellness department. Ifara Morani, who came in and said, yes, let's put together a script department that is now the writing department, led by Liesl Lafferty and Fran Caviello. Sedna Fiati comes in and supports our social justice department. Folks like Anita McFarlane, who hosts our brunch every Sunday and makes sure that there is a safe space for folks to come together and find their like-minded people. What kind of jewel is that? It's people like Amelia Copeland from England saying yes and contributing to the wellness department but also the mentorship department. It's people like Shane Stoltz, Jennifer Rowley, Jordan Giddens, Monique Marion that stepped in and helped with our editing. And the OG editor Sebastian Biga who was at Grace and Matthews and also Grace and Matthews housed us for a bunch of sessions. So shout out to all the editors. It's all these folks that just say yes. Yes to the vision, yes to the journey. It's been a dream and I have to say, being in a position of leadership is not for the faint of heart. But I'm up for it and I'm excited by it. I'm excited about the tricky conversations because it means that we're risking and we're taking chances. I'm also in for the victories of hearing that we now have new writers in the world because of what the Firecracker Department started. We now have new artists, we have directors, we have producers because of the community that Firecracker Department is. And that to me is what it's all about. We always say that Firecracker Department supports creative action. We ask people what they're working on and how we can help. And I feel like that kind of attitude with a strategy of positivity is gonna make a difference in our industry. I really do believe that. And again, I might have created this sandbox called the Firecracker Department, but everybody else just brought pails and pixie dust and chocolate and maybe a box of wine to contribute to it. And it's made this journey and my life just incredible. All right, all that being said, it's our 150th. It's time to celebrate the way we celebrate every tip with a Blaze Award winner. Jan Arden, Michelle Buteau, Joe Vanicola. Who's it gonna be this year? Hmm? Who's it gonna be? Hey, if you have suggestions, send them my way. I'd love any suggestions. We have a couple of ideas, but we're open to suggestions. Not only is this our 150th episode, it is our five year and I have enjoyed every step of the way. Truly, what an honor to be part of this journey with every single firecracker. From the core uh, that was an alum, uh, we have a whole bunch of new ember firecrackers. All those people make my life just so much more. Okay, now speaking of more, I got something for you. I'm told from the head producer of this podcast, Triple W, wonderful Winnie Wong, that there's a little message from the firecracker actioneers and the heads of the department. Here we go. Hi, my name's AJ and I'm a proud member of the Firecracker Department. I can't believe we've been around for five years. This is so exciting. Happy anniversary, Firecrackers. I'm Kathleen Harkwell, policy nerd, producer, Firecracker actioneer, and a very proud member of the Mentorship Department. Wishing Firecracker Department a happy fifth anniversary. Hey everyone, I'm Fran, co-head of the Writing Department, and I'm here to wish the Firecracker Department a happy fifth anniversary. Hi, I'm Veronica Martin, creativity coach and HR consultant and actioneer, head of the mentorship department and Firecracker Artist Way facilitator. I want to wish everyone in the Firecracker department a very happy fifth anniversary. Hi, I'm Paulina. I'm a marketing consultant and a filmmaker in the works. I'm the head of the comms department and an actioneer, wishing Firecracker department a happy fifth anniversary. Here's to five more. Hi, it's Liesl. I'm a script writer and story developer at large and co-head of the Firecracker Writing Department. I facilitate the script writing workshops and our Save the Cat book club. I give free consultations and regularly attend the writing bursts, the Sunday brunches, and I definitely listen to the podcast. I love Naomi and all the Firecrackers. Happy fifth anniversary, everyone. Hi, I'm Winnie Wong, a director, writer, producer, publicist, and I'm the head podcast producer at Firecracker Department. I'm also an actioneer and part of the social justice department. Stopping by to wish Firecracker Department a very happy fifth anniversary. And also, we're celebrating our 150th guest. There's lots to celebrate here at Firecracker Department. Yay! There's just so much to celebrate. I know it's a long intro, but there's a lot to be grateful for. And I gotta just 
say it out loud. So here we are, 150th, and we are going to keep the celebrating going with our guest this week. You thought I was excited about celebrating five years or 150. The guest this week is London-based, award-winning Canadian comedian, actor, writer, and producer, Mae Martin. I think the world of Mae Martin. I first met Mae back at Second City when they were a baby. And we speak about this together in this podcast. I'm not going to go into it. But I have to tell you that I knew there was something special about Mae. And I knew it was not an easy time for them when I first met them. So seeing where they've come to and what they've gotten through to get where they are, I just have such buckets of admiration for that. Nobody's got an easy path as an artist. But there's some folks that have it easier than others. And I have to say, May worked their butt off to get to where they are. I'm in awe of that kind of strength, that kind of persistence, that kind of drive, and that kind of passion. I'm here for it all. All of it. It makes me emotional to think of what they've gotten through and where they are today. And uh, I feel really, really lucky that we were able to have some time together on this podcast. So as I said, May started doing comedy at the age of 13. 13, what were you doing at 13? I wasn't doing this. I think I was teaching dance and maybe writing really bad poetry. Yeah, about faces behind masks, that kind of stuff. Not what May was doing. May dropped out of school at 15 to pursue comedy full time. They trained at the Second City and they were the youngest person to be nominated for the Tim Sims Encouragement Fund Award. At 16, they were nominated for a Canadian Comedy Award. And recently, they won a Canadian Comedy Award for their work as a writer on Baroness Von Sketch Show. What a great circle. I also love the chat and story that May told about Carolyn Taylor from the Baroness Von Sketch Show. You gotta stay tuned for that. Now you may recognize May from Netflix's Feel Good where they play May. Go figure, because they wrote it. Lisa Kudrow stars as their mom and Charlotte Ritchie stars as their love interest named George. This semi-autobiographical comedy drama series was created and co-written by May. Feel Good is praised worldwide, worldwide with a perfect 100% certified fresh score on Rotten Tomatoes. If you haven't seen it, pause, go watch a few episodes and come back. May's performance earned them a Royal Television Society Breakthrough Award and BAFTA TV Award nomination. They were also nominated for a Royal Television Society Best Comedy Writer Award. And wait, there's more. Okay, Feel Good won the Edinburgh TV Award for Best Comedy as well as the Best Comedy Drama Series at the C21 Award and Best Scripted Representation of LGBTQ Plus at the MIPCOM Diversify TV Awards. That's so much. So much is going on. Recently, Feel Good won a Writers Guild of Great Britain Award for Best Situation Comedy. And if you haven't seen it, as I said, pause but just go over and watch Feel Good because it'll do that. It'll make you feel good. You will not be disappointed. The writing is fantastic. The acting is great. It's awkwardly beautiful and beautifully awkward. It's everything. May's last stand-up show, Dope, focused on addiction and it was nominated for Best Comedy Show at the prestigious Edinburgh Comedy Awards while earning four and five star national reviews in the UK. The show has since been turned into a stand-up special for Netflix as part of their first global stand-up series, Comedians of the World. In May's spare time, come on, what kind of spare time? How? Well, you've got so much, uh, you still have spare time. Okay. In May's spare time, they wrote the book, Can Everyone Please Calm Down? A Guide to 21st Century Sexuality. And if you are ever curious to know more about the pros and cons of labels to coming out and the joys of sexual fluidity, May ponders all of this in their book. It's amazing. They're amazing. You can grab a copy on Amazon or listen to it on Audible or Apple Books. Now get a load of this. You will soon be able to see May in their recurring guest role in HBO's The Flight Attendant. First season was so good. I can't wait to see May in this show. I mean, we talk about it in my chat as well. So all of that. I just can't wait. I can't wait for more May. All right. Let's not wait. Let's get on with it. Here they are, Mae Martin. (gasps) Mae fucking Uh, Martin. Dude, you look the same. I mean, you do too, my friend. Um, It's been way too long, buddy. I'm so, I have everything. I have like 
nostalgia feelings i'm, I'm yeah. like a little emotional yeah about I, f- I feel emotional too i feel like it's really nice to reconnect yeah. i've been ner- i was kind of nervous about it me like too. i too yeah me too i was like fuck i just yeah i got this and i started being like all vibrating yeah. Like, yeah 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 i think yeah because i guess we we met when i was a teenager like in such a tumultuous time so i think having not spoken since then and then like everything's worked out it's emotional (laughs) it is it's sort of like a way of looking back and and going like it is gonna be okay because it yeah it has been and then I've always like you know my family's in in England and so in my brain I was like I'm gonna come to England and then I'm gonna be like I'm taking you out because I've wanted this connection for so long like I yeah that was such like a tornado of life in your teens Mm -hmm. that I was periphery to and then I always felt like I didn't feel good about, um, I don't know, not connecting with you after that. So I'm really grateful. Oh, for that. thanks. That's so yeah. nice. That's really I mean, nice. I'm, I get insecure about like, cause it was such a, a mess. Sometimes when I come back to Toronto, I'm like, I don't know how people remember me or what, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I'm like, cause I was, uh, yeah, it was just such a yeah tornado of like adolescent craziness yeah. how do you rec- <laughs> how do you reconcile with that because I think we all have these kind of like you know like moments of uh shame or moments that I'm not proud of and then I step into a zone where I'm like oh they know me yeah like yeah that. yeah but I I mean honestly one of the things I see in your work and I've, I've seen it like even as a teen I remember seeing it going that's just you that's just you putting this out and there's like a bravery to your system that I don't think there was ever a choice not to be brave in May Martin's world. Yeah. How do you figure that out when you come back to worlds like that? Well, the nice thing is that I think what you said, like everyone feels that walking into any space, everyone's just thinking about themselves. Like, and, you know, <laughs> right. and so yeah. that's nice to know. And so much time's passed and everybody's just doing their own their own thing. But yeah, so we met in Toronto in, in my, maybe I was sort of 14 when I like, started hanging around 14 really I was 13 when I started doing stuff at Tim Sims and no kidding yeah yeah but luckily I was just thinking today like you know YouTube wasn't around smartphones weren't around so I don't have many videos or pictures from that period of six or seven years so yeah it's all a bit muddled in my head and and feels so far away and dreamlike so it's nice to reconnect with people and be like yeah thank god no YouTube eh I think that all the time. I think I, I was just trying on different personalities, you know, and, yeah. and when like most teenagers do, I think. Yeah. But I remember doing stand up and thinking it would be pretty cool. That is that Tim Sims if I was smoking a cigarette on stage. And everyone was just like, that's so disrespectful. And also weird to see a child smoking. So I was like, <laughs> doing, and I remember there were complaints. Like it, it was, yeah. And I was just trying to be Bill Hicks or something, like thinking yeah. I was this, like, yeah so thank god there's no record of that it was it was nice to be allowed to fail over and over right I mean we don't have that now so but I feel like you have really great failure muscles thanks like (laughs) but do you know what I mean like you're brave like the work that I've seen you do I'm such a fan I have to like settle down because I I get I really am truly not only of you as a human as artist but like the intelligence that you have behind your work I see you working like I know that you're you're working through stuff on stage and how public is that have you ever had regret about doing any of that publicly definitely I had a a real wave of panic before each season of feel good came out like just yeah uh, you know because you you just have to shut off that fear of vulnerability while as you're making it because otherwise you'd self-edit too much and not write it or and not do it but then in the edit sitting and watching it it's like oh my god what have I done and then yeah just I was worried about my parents reaction I was worried yeah. about people's reactions basically and then of, of course like the more you reveal and the more vulnerable you are the more people connect to it and then that's really affirming and cathartic to have people be like oh yeah I know that feeling you know yeah, yeah. I don't know where I started becoming addicted to looking cool but I know there was like that's the same. thing that I have to sort of divorce myself from yeah same. I, I, yeah because I don't I feel like you just <laughs> you're I feel like, like you're not vulner- cool no 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 no. The opposite. I feel like your <laughs> vulnerability is the cool thing about you like somewhere along the lines you went I'm gonna embrace this so that it's not chasing the dragon of coolness oh thanks yeah I still see it in myself when I'm trying to be cool and 
Yeah. I, I'm like a very, I'm quite like physically inhibited. Like for instance, I just did that. This, it just came out today. This reality show, last one laughing Canada. I mean, it looks fantastic. Colin and I spoke about it when it was in production. He didn't give me any, any spoilers, but it sounded really, but I, well, I was... thought it sounded fun. But then Matt was like, that sounds like a nightmare trying to make other comics laugh. Yeah, it, it was a nightmare and it really highlighted like my limitations as a comic. Like, because mm -hmm. I, I wish I had that kind of uninhibited clowniness that Colin Mockery has. Like, he just doesn't care. And uh, I'm like, just my body's quite tense. I'm kind of like, I'm overthinking. I'm trying to think of a witty remark. And like, him and Tom Green were just such clowns and totally, you know dominated they were amazing and I yeah. just was like oh god why can't I just get over myself and do something insane but yeah and what do you think do you have an answer for that <laughs> I don't for know <laughs> I sometimes think I'm still I think everyone is still kind of just trying to show their high school bullies that they're cool you know <laughs> like right. uh, kind of your whole life and so I, I I do need to get over that yeah yeah worrying about what I look like and yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I, I just don't think anybody's alone. I think everybody's got that kind of, um, I don't know, vanity. Like, was there a moment that you found yourself vulnerable and relatable, but as you said, and then that was the addiction. That was the thing that you're like, Oh, that's what I yeah. want. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I think just in doing stand up and I had been doing like musical comedy and other stand up and things, and then had a big breakup and that this is like 20, 15 16 and then and things had already been going well but then when I started talking about the breakup that's when like I could just feel the difference in in stand-up mm. audiences it's such an immediate feedback that you get like the the mood of a room and the the feedback afterwards and stuff so then I was talking a lot about addiction and relationships and then that was where feel good came from those themes okay in my mind this is how it works and I know this is a bit you're like oh I'm gonna go to England oh here's a show like, I know that's not how it is, but can, I want to hear, because I've always had in my dream, like, maybe I'll move to England one day. I don't know. And I think that might've passed now, but I did for a while seriously consider moving to England. You have like a, a British sensibility, I think. That's where well, I think a lot of Canadians do. Are your parents British? Yeah. My dad's British, super British. Yeah. So the comedy. British comedy. What did you grow up on? Python and like, yeah. I loved Eddie Izzard a lot. Yeah. and French and Saunders was huge yeah. for me That's is your family from like northern England so my mom was Manchester but my pop's yeah. Lithuanian oh wow no way mm -hmm. so. yeah Manchester's got such a distinct Mancunian culture like they yeah I love we filmed season one of my show in there yeah, yeah. I read well, that but tell me the steps of like I'm gonna go to England well I'd I guess you do have to go back which is okay that I'd like started doing comedy and then I, I dropped out of school when I was like 15 and I was working at Second City in the box office and then got kicked out of my house 16 and then so it was when I was like 20 that I was stopping doing any drugs and I'd met this amazing woman and she was gonna go and do a master's degree in England and I was like okay I'll come too and I, I didn't want to stay I thought I'd go for a year and then I really loved it and I have I have a British passport yeah and then yeah, because I guess I'd done a few things in Canada, I managed to skip like the open mic circuit. Like I, I was like very aggressively emailing people and yeah. And then doing the Edinburgh Fringe, you, you meet everyone and it's, it's like camp because the whole comedy world here is structured around doing the Edinburgh Fringe every year. Yeah. You're churning out like an hour of new material every year. And it is just like, everything moves quicker, but yeah, it wasn't until it took about seven or eight years before I had any before feel good came around yeah. yeah like was that part of your thoughts like I know I'm gonna stick it out in England or did you think like were you sort of I don't know were yeah, you sort of starting so. fresh it felt like starting fresh for sure yeah but I fell in love with it pretty fast yeah 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 what I liked it. well the scale of I'm only talking about work things on a personal yeah. level I just like the cynicism and the, the kind of yeah yeah, and it was familiar to me. Like I used to spend every Christmas and summer here when I was a mm -hmm. kid. Work-wise, just the scale. Like there, I think there's more than 200 comedy clubs in London alone, and that's. I mean, just compared to Toronto, that's mm -hmm. like there's so much more opportunity. So, yeah, yeah. you can tour around because it's so small. Yeah, like in Canada, you're you know driving hours and hours to get out of town, and like you can get to Scotland in five hours on a train. You know? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's something that I think for all stand-ups is they have tenacity. You have to. Like, you can't just become a stand-up and go, I'm a stand-up and I'm going to binge watch other TV shows. You have to get your your muscles. Yeah, in. yeah. whenever people ask for advice, it's hard to be, because there's not really any shortcuts besides just doing it and immersing yourself in it, I think. like Yeah, here's what I think, is that, like, somehow you've actually designed the perfect career, even with, like, the chaos that it started with, like, that probably threw you into things, but then you got your improv training, which really, I, I see you, you writing through improv. Mm. Um, what is your process with, uh, with stand-up work? I write all my stand-up through improv, yeah. Well, you have an idea, and then you're like, I'm going to throw this idea about denty floss. Yeah. Like, it's like, you can't steal that. That's gold. So that's that's like, gold. Yeah. <laughs> um, y- yeah. I do it like um, I get the audience to write down questions and then I riff off the questions and that gives you a good sense of what people want to hear you talk about. And then I'll also have like a theme in my head. Like I'm sort of writing something about youth culture now. So and then I'll kind of approach it like writing an essay. Like I'll, I will I do tons of research and stuff. But first of all, it's just doing improvising and just hoping that the adrenaline makes you find a punchline you know yeah has it ever failed you oh yeah I but I really don't mind bombing I find it I actually love do you love like watching people bomb I find it so heroic and kind of beautiful like I really love it when people are just dying and yeah up on stage and I think it's one of it's so beautiful yeah so I don't I love that you said that that. no no I love that you said gosh this is such an emotional chat, May. It's like, but it, it, it uh, resonates so much with me. I just watched this show at the Comedy Bar in Toronto where it was all newbies. Uh, oh, wow. Precious Chong's stand-up class. And yeah. I felt the same thing. I was like, fuck, good for you. Like, yeah. You know, like some of them didn't even have English as their first language. I'm like, what the f-? Oh my like, God. Yeah, it's and it's beautiful. Like, what compels us to do that? To put ourselves, th- yeah. What, what do, do you, you think, think it is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know you know I I don't know I'm, I think I'm lucky I I started young enough that it was like almost I mean I was just going through puberty so it was before you even have all that self-doubt maybe like I just got in the cusp of before <laughs> the insane but also I don't know approval and I'm sure like looking back I felt you know confused about who I was and my body and my sexuality and stuff so that probably was part of it being I went to an all-girls school I was probably just like questioning things in a way that the people in my class weren't having to question them yet like the sort of things that we were being told about everything from like a very like binary world and sort of the assumed preset being heterosexuality like I think if you're a kid and feeling like something's wrong here this doesn't fit for me so your choice is either you question the validity of the system or you question your own validity and luckily I think I had good parents who so I was like oh it's it's the system that's wrong which is so lucky that my parents were like liberal in terms of those aspects of me and I understand like figuring out you know who we are gosh I mean I'm still figuring out but for you to do it on stage like did you know that you needed to address what that level of confusion was for you on stage like, cause you could have just gone, Hey, dandy floss. Am I right? Again, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you instead went into like all these pretty, like, I, I feel like you broke a lot of ground with your stand up because you did address a lot of things that are just now kind of coming to light with, you know, gender identity and pronouns and things like that. Yeah. I guess but back then I was just doing characters and, and making fun of myself and my teachers. And so, yeah, that's only, only like, really in my adult life in my 30s really that I've been like confident enough to speak eloquently about those things because I was too in it you know grappling with it I think and you need distance from things I think to be able to I mean that's a great question so when you went through this big breakup that I feel like is one of the turning points in your life did you take some distance or were you like I'm gonna take Nataro this and get right on stage I think it was more like uh I realized because my reaction to the breakup was so massive. Like I just felt, uh, you know, that like the type of heartbreak that you hear in songs suddenly, but yeah. I kind of realized that it was just proportionate. And I looked at the relationship and saw how similar it was to addictive behavior of mine in the past mm. and making that connection and being like, 
that addictive behavior is permeating all these aspects of my life, then I think that made me then able to finally think about and talk about and process like serious drug addiction. So then I think that was a big breakthrough because then I, mm-hmm. I had enough distance from the addiction addiction. So even though the breakup was really fresh, it was a way of like drawing connections and intellectualizing it. I believe everything you're saying. I, you know what I love is the fact that like you dropped out of school and you're one of the most eloquent people I know. <laughs> nice. Like the way you investigate your comedy is such at a, well, it's interesting because it's such a, at an intellectual level because I see you comparing things to things that are in nice. heavy books, which is my <laughs> education level. I did a, a diploma in shiatsu massage therapy. Oh, and, I beg your pardon. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was, uh, if you don't mind. So like, I hear, but I realized really early on that um, I was never going to be a masseuse. I didn't, but it was, it was just helpful at that time in my life to, but I, what I did was I spent the whole two years just reading under my desk. And I, I really was like, okay, if this is going to be my secondary education, I'm going to use the time. And I did read like all mythology and poetry. Yeah. And I really, stu- I tried to memorize a lot of stuff. And because my parents were paying for the diploma, the Shiatsu massage diploma, I didn't want to waste the time, but I really, really hated the class. Every yeah. man in the class had a ponytail it was so they were also like seething with rage too and then trying to teach like yogic you know love it yeah yeah mindfulness yeah I feel like most of the things I know are from that period of two years of just reading under my desk when I should have been learning about anatomy yeah but aren't you learning now like I feel like what's your chapter that you're on right now that you're learning right now i'm reading i'm watching a lot of reality tv nice uh, oh my god i totally watching... binged um, uh, um love is blind me That's too nice. me too oh, I'm why not... am i yeah, so yeah, obsessed yeah. with that it's riveting it's riveting it's so it's it awkward feels like they genuinely want to find love though that's what's nice it's yeah. better than like it's better than love island or those ones where because you're like these people are so laying it all on the they're like i want love i know yeah I know it just keeps coming back to that like I feel like yeah. when you talk about when we go into like bombing on stage and things like that I I feel like it's love like I feel like the love that we feel and are able to share through comedy I I never take that for granted like for some reason I had that gene that I'm able to do that and I'm always like oh my god so to be able on stage and, and bomb and get through it I'm like I'm gonna keep loving I'm gonna yeah. keep going it's like yeah 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 connecting with people in that way it's pretty it's pretty addictive pretty great but I asked you about learning like what's your thing that you're learning right now other than binging which I'm I also think is learning uh, yeah I read a lot but I'm I'm mainly yeah just taking a taking a bit of a break I'm mm-hmm. I'm writing a book proposal so I am learning about youth culture and like I, I feel like we don't know what to do with teenagers as uh-huh. a culture like we kind of deride them and and also sexualize them and then we expect them to be adults but also we're like you're a child and we send them to war and so I'm I'm looking throughout history at youth culture and then also thinking about my own life and stuff yeah I don't know (laughs) what happens in your brain as a teenager that I'm interested in that what do you what do you think like I mean it's funny because it's been a while since since you were a teenager and yet it it feels like it was such a pivotal time that it you still reflect back hard to yeah. stay in the present I bet that's what you got to talk to a therapist about I definitely yeah. I can't get over my teens I'm it still feels like the most vivid time of my life and mm. and so confusing and con- so yeah I definitely s- still process it but I think hopefully a lot of people do I mean we still make all these shows about teenagers and it's because all those firsts and those experiences oh, yeah. are so are so intense yeah and defining whether you're winning the cream of comedy at the age of six years old, I know you weren't six, you were like 16, but like, or, you know, whatever we do as a teenage does define us. And I don't know, maybe we don't feel like we have as many choices as we do as you get, get older. So things are kind yeah. of thrown at you as a teen. Yeah, maybe. And you feel pretty invincible. And yeah. I feel like you're so like out there right now, like with your, with your work and stuff that Oh, I think gosh. I'm a bit of a workaholic though. Like I feel, I, yeah, I'm so scared of it stopping. So I'm like, I say yes to everything and I'm like, really I'm both. really ambitious and stuff, which maybe not in the best way, but it was nice. Like the first few months of lockdown to 
really have a minute to stop and I played a lot of guitar and was trying to be creative just for creativity's sake and not yeah. trying to like monetize it all the time you know? well yeah. that's interesting too because I think we do you know we start to create art because we love it it's it's a passion and then suddenly it becomes a business yeah and then it's like I gotta create art to be part of the like how do you reckon with that I think that's a for sure a, a struggle yeah to tune out the voice that's like what do people want to buy yeah and be like what do I actually want to say um yeah and also know when to say nothing and mm. just because I guess you need to live a life to then explore that life right and you, you I guess you see people losing touch and their comedy becoming worse <laughs> as they as the, yeah. the more popular they get you know I feel really present with stand-up uh -huh. when the jokes start to feel flat because you've just done them too many times that's why I'm so glad that I love improv I, I think improv's mm -hmm. the best of all the types of comedy but there's nothing worse than bad improv no bad stand-up is worse because then you know the person sat down and they thought this is funny I want to say this but when it's bad improv you think oh well you just made it up anyway so you know <laughs> right. right but nothing's yeah. better than great improv Oh, nothing is better. It's like magic in a bowl. It really is so kind of cosmic in a way, like tapping into that flow and everybody being on the same page. And that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's like good sex. It's like when you're having like this connection with your audience, it's like a big room yeah. of good sex. Yeah. <laughs> it's orgiastic. Yeah. 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 But you're right about like when I watch bad improv, I used to get really angry because I'd be like, come on, you're blocking or come on, like, but then I realized it's all fear, right? Like it's all people just scared. I'm just going to say a poo poo bum bum joke. Not yeah. because I think I'm going to be insulting, but because I've, I'm just fucking surviving. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot more forgivable than someone who's sat down and gone. What I really want to say is this poo poo bum bum <laughs> joke. And I'm, I want people to hear it. But that also is somewhat endearing to me when I think, <laughs> when I see them like lining up and like, anyway. And so, you know, this rude <laughs> yeah. joke. And then they, they have like the confidence of the delivery and then they realize it's not as funny. Oh as my they God. Think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like on my nights off, I still go see comedy. I really, yeah. I hope I don't stop being a, a, a massive fan of, of comedy. When you have a joke, like you said, you're working on things. Like what was, what was your process with getting into feel good? Was that something that you knew you needed to write or was that something that somebody was like, you got to put this down? Channel 4 had said, if you were to, write a scripted comedy exploring those same themes that you do in your stand-up like addiction and love what would you write and then and then yeah I knew right away what I like exactly what I wanted it to be and that I wanted it to be a love story and me and my co-writer Joe knew where both seasons were gonna go so it was cool knowing where season two was gonna go in season one and yeah so I definitely knew oh but yeah. in terms of jokes I think we were just hyper aware of ever being too self-indulgent or too navel gazy. So anytime it got slightly morose in the rhythm, like in reading it out loud, we just add gags and we're like ridiculous. There's words we find funny, like wasps, snakes, worms, things like that. Sure. Yeah. No, notice that's... There's a lot of that and feel good. <laughs> but that's interesting what you said about rhythm. Cause I think that's something that you can't, um, I don't know if you can teach that. Like you must feel that in your stand-up. Do you find that that's where you learned your your rhythms? Maybe actually, yeah. Well, definitely if you're doing stand-up and you want to say something sincere, yeah, and feeling confident enough that you can bring the audience back to laughter after that and bring them out of that place, that I think that's important. You don't want to just be like, and my childhood was tricky. Good night, everyone. <laughs> like you want to... Wait a second. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you go into something like Feel Good and then... I know that you're, you've are you got this role on the flight attendant too. Yeah. What was that like? You just said that with a little trepidation. Yeah, I'm nervous about it. It's the first time, like, I'm, I don't know, because you're not in the edit. You don't get to choose right. what takes or, you know, it was the first time I, I really acted in someone else's thing. So it was, I found it really nerve wracking. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I had a great time. It was so, so fun. But yeah, I'm nervous to see it. I hope people like it. I just watched season one and then tried yeah. to make sure I was doing a performance that would sit in the world of that show and the tone of that show but you never know so we'll see well how did you gear up for it like did you do a process did you go into like script analysis and stuff like that because you're coming from a different aspect of your art 
Yeah, I tried to do like what I hoped that actors would do in Feel Good. Like I was like, well, if I'd written this, I'd want someone to Ooh. look at yeah the intent behind each line and things like that so I did it I did a bit I asked for help from actor friends and and stuff but it's such a, a massive machine that yeah. show the you know hundreds of crew and it was it was so exciting and like different British tv feels really like gorilla small tiny yeah. <laughs> not much time not much money and this was ex really exciting I just felt starstruck the whole time yeah I mean yeah I watched the first season so I can't wait I can't wait yeah. to see you in it. I don't know. I mean, that it seems like you keep putting yourself into new territory. Is that something you've always done? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. And then and then see if you like it and what you want to do. I want to do I'd love to like make a an album of music or something. That's I you know what I really admire Carolyn Taylor. If anyone's listening, that that's a I guess a, a mutual friend of ours who's in that show, Baroness von Sketch show, and she feels like she really works to live instead of living to work. And she also mm. has like a, a, a true artistic spirit where it's like, like she just made an album. Sometimes she'll be like, oh, I'm just making sculptures out of beeswax. Yeah. And like, yeah. like <laughs> she'll try everything. And it's really about just what she wants to do in the moment. And she paints like, she, yeah, she just will try her hand at everything. I really admire yeah. that. Yeah. Me too. Uh, I was understudying Carolyn at Second City. So it was the joy of learning a new musical instrument every show. Yeah. Because yeah. she'd be like, oh, learn the tuba if you want to understudy me. And I'd be like, okay. Oh God, yeah, the tuba. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I remember seeing her place and seeing she had like a phone, like an old cell phone in the frame. And she was like, yeah, art's everywhere. I was like, I just yeah. love her brain so much. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I really love her brain. She's been a really important person in my life, I think. And yeah. especially, yeah, when I look, think back at that time of being a teenager, she, she was like, we were really close and we always really got on and connected, but she was also boundaried, you know, until I was an adult, like <laughs> to be actual friends. And, and she, yeah, she was really there for me though. Like in, in my teens, I remember when I just got kicked out and I got banned from second city. So I really felt like a pariah and so humiliated that, oh. you know, all these people I looked up to like oh I was so embarrassed and uh she just like once a month she took me for a burger and all through like you know 16 17 18 and I would just look forward to it and it was so like innocent and nice and it meant so much yeah mm -hmm. yeah I have regret about that like how you left and I wish I'd been more forthright with being able to step in and and support I, I think I was such on the periphery but I do regret not being able to be like oh fuck, no that's no rough. no if anything I think yeah we never I think it's probably because you're like this is a kid like we never like bonded in that way probably because you'd be at a party like what is this kid doing here <laughs> like in a <laughs> way right. I, yeah smoking were, in the corner yeah. yeah like you were a grown-up which was nice yeah yeah I mean gosh that's such that building you know is such a whirlwind you know there's no way of having any surety of any steps like if you think yeah you know like oh I know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a b and c and then somebody's gonna put into it's actually a b furry fish yeah, <laughs> yeah like it's yeah, just yeah. who knows so I think everybody yeah. does the best they could and I think it felt like a real moment in time as well where just sort of before any of these conversations started being had or like there was there definitely felt like there was no like HR kind of vibe you know no. what I mean and also I I think I was very headstrong and badly behaved too so yeah do you ever look back at your world and go like I've created this like based on what the the ingredients I was given do you have that kind of self-aware self-pride almost yeah and I, I don't ever pause and take stock like that mm. but yeah that's nice thank you yeah yeah I mean, I know I can hear your hustle and I I also have that workaholic quality that I wish yeah. I was more like Coco and like, I'm going to make wax figurines, but I don't, I don't do that. I know I need to do it. Totally. I, I play the guitar a lot. And if I think I've written something like the other day, I was like, maybe I should send this to my agent. And I was like, what am I doing? I'm not a good guitar <laughs> player, but I really enjoy doing it. I should just protect that and do it. Yeah. Yeah. For myself. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Did, do you, how do you feel like with, you know, if this book that you're writing um, about teenagers, like there's a level of responsibility that that comes with. Do you, do you get burdened with that? 
not so much with a book but in general yeah with young people coming to shows and mm -hmm. yeah for sure i i mean yeah i'm just terrified that i'm gonna do something wrong all the time i mean that's good to know with somebody that's like embracing new pronouns because everybody around is also feeling that so we're all living in this sort of oh, yeah. agile fear oh my god yeah I the mean, best of intentions yeah that's all that matters is is trying like i i wrote a book for teenagers about gender and sexuality by the time it had come out it was outdated and right. also my feelings had changed and i was doing shows and getting people's pronouns wrong and making assumptions and yeah i'm a big advocate for like everyone just trying their best and yeah, yeah and, and people having room to get it wrong yeah i i think that's a healthy way to be but also i will also say we can all do better like i know there's certain parts that i'm like oh i'm still making that error and it's just um just keep yeah. trying yeah well someone the other day was like oh it's you know the new words are so hard and i was like yeah but like omicron like we all <laughs> we learned that pretty fast you know yeah. it depends on the word it seems more difficult but yeah well i love something you said in one of your stand-ups about like not thinking about how you wanted to pursue like whether it's women or men because you don't know who you're gonna love like just love until you find the person that you're like oh that's my person yeah that's my people yeah it seems crazy the way we think about it mm -hmm. and the us and them mentality and having to declare it and it's it's just a tricky one because like visibility is still so important so it feels like important for me to mm -hmm. say i'm this because it's still a thing but then of course i'd rather not say that at all and just be myself you know hey, yeah 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 for sure what yeah. was that like when you put your pronouns out there well i still get my own pronouns wrong so i i don't uh <laughs> so people yeah, are correcting that, you yeah um, it, yeah yeah it yeah. was it was scary doing that doing that post yeah, yeah there's still there's a real hysteria in the uk right now around gender and trans issues and things and i get a lot of hostility from these like trans exclusionary radical feminists they, these white women in their 50s and 60s and they come to my shows and they send letters backstage and they tell me i'm a disgrace and i've wow. let down the side and that it's really wild so that and it's crazy because they would have been people that i maybe thought would be on the right side i don't know right so yeah i i never i don't like to incur their wrath but and that just reminds you how important it is too. They just today started, there's an article in um, the Telegraph that all trans people need to carry ID cards. Like it just feels really dystopian and like mm. creepy. Yeah. yeah. So how do you put like a boundary so that you can not soak that in? I would find, I would take it also personally. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, it depends on the day. Some days I find it really paralyzing and a downer, but then yeah, it's kind of lose lose. If it affects you personally and you talk about it a lot, then it's like, oh, they never stop talking about it. And then, you know what I mean? Right. And also, it's emotional for you because you care about it. So it's really hard to win a, a debate if you're emotional, you know, and they've got all the stats or their weird things that they've dug out. To, so I don't know. It's, it's a real, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. But the feeling that you get at like a live show or the, you know, overwhelmingly positive feedback I get online is. Mm -hmm. You just have to not focus on like it is a minority the the negative stuff yeah, yeah. hopefully it balances out yeah for sure or yeah, like yeah. the good outweigh because i feel like the the work you're doing like is extraordinary like just just by Thanks, your presence man. like i do i'm i'm not um that's that's no smoke i really do and i i really admire and i envy your your vulnerability i envy like how brave you are and uh oh, i'm trying you. to get a couple pages out of the martin book Thank you. That's really nice. Well, I, I, I'm just enjoying doing improv these days and being purely silly and puerile as well. I think mm -hmm. there's so much space for that stuff too. It's yeah, it's so it's so important. So right, because everybody sees you as this like role model. Be like, okay, let's get to the hard hitting information. Yeah. But also, let's <laughs> yeah. just be silly. Let's make some fart noises with our underarms. Oh my god, yeah, and like, <laughs> yeah, totally. I think that can be as revolutionary. Yeah. Oh, we have to wrap it up. I could honestly, I, I really do uh, want to find a time to see you in person. And I hope that whether it's in this country or that country, we'll have time. I'd love that. Yeah, I'm always, I'm back in town a few times a year. I'd love a, a lunch. That would be so nice. Let me take you out for a burger. 
Oh my god. Oh, stop. Yeah. I'm now I'm going to cry. Yeah. <laughs> there is such a nostalgia around like those days at Second City that I I crave so much so spe- spending time with you has been like a really nice coming home a little bit. Yeah, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Right? Like, yeah, yeah, it was really uh, maybe th- that's why it's still so so vivid to me. It was it was really fun too. So, first of all, you, we're going to do a tables turn and you can ask me a question. What is your favorite trivia fact? It could be about nature or <gasps> celebrities or history or All right, this is a book that my we had growing up called Extraordinary Origins of Everyday Things that I Ooh. just love and you know what I've got two copies so when we see each other I'm bringing you this I would Um, love that it's so fun and it's like 500 uh, you know everyday items expressions and customs such as Kleenex Barbie dolls and Boy Scouts like who doesn't want to know where those came from I love that the only the one that comes to mind is that corduroy that uh pants was corps du roi so that a king's pants was made out of sewing a bunch of cords together no way yeah so they were so the king was the only one who would wear well i mean we're gonna have to fact check that one but that's 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 what it means yeah that's good i'll write that down it's good what's yours what's your fun fact i'm a big fact person um sloths can hold their breath underwater for 45 minutes which is longer than dolphins come on pretty insane every two minutes we take as many photographs as we did in the entire 19th century oh my god so (laughs) things like that yeah yeah that's good i love things that put the whole thing in perspective like that i did too i did too i love finding out where we've come from to know where we are now and how like even a decade from now you and i'll talk and be like remember when we used to not be able to like sit in the same room even though you were in england and i was in canada yeah and now there's holograms do you think in our lifetime we'll get some answers about like life on other planets and things like that it's moving quickly I feel like there already are answers I think maybe revealing them I do think that there there are things that people haven't revealed or that people don't want to accept 100% have you seen there's an Amazon documentary called phenomena or phenomenon I don't know but it's it's good it's about just all the thousands of recorded incidents i love your brain so much that you watched like things like that documentary but then also love is blind because i yeah. totally understand <laughs> yeah, yeah. that we can't do it all we can't always do love is blind we can't always do documentaries exactly yeah, yeah. you gotta have a good balance the high brown low brow although i wouldn't oh. call phenomenon high brow okay <laughs> but it's still like, it's like a, a guy in arkansas being like i saw a ship but they took me up right right but yeah. you know what like who am i to to judge those experiences I'm not you know yeah everybody has their world gosh who knew that we were going to live through a pandemic as we are right now like that that still boggles my mind that we're living without being how we were two years ago oh my god I know I know just the word pandemic was it it, it was so not even on my radar that anything like this could ever happen it would it would never have occurred to me no and and we won't have anyone really I think seriously contextualizing it and processing it for a a decade or something all right here's some wrap-up questions for you Mm. fill in the blank to me a firecracker is uh somebody who is authentic makes an impact what do you uh what do you want to be best known for creating something that really endures in the global consciousness like that's an insane thing to say but like when i think about how much um things like star wars mean to me you know Mm -hmm. and these things that have really penetrated and and felt like yeah i mean that would be amazing wouldn't Mm -hmm. it i'm absolutely that's the legacy idea right and here's the thing that i've navigating around is that like my pop died last year i'm sorry world-renowned organic chemist nobel nominated wow like, like a big thing and I remember like talking to him in like one of his last weeks and he was like you know what no big whoop and I think the reality is that we will be forgotten which is heartbreaking but like there are people out there now that don't know what Star Wars is you're so right and also that comes from a just a fear of death doesn't it that sure or just to be forgotten like I mean I get it but Mm. I know I will be forgotten (laughs) yeah yeah we will be 
Yeah. Yeah. Unless Elon Musk can pull something out of the bag. I mean, <laughs> I, I would cryogenically freeze myself or put my consciousness into like a toaster or something for sure. Uh, I, my mom was like, um, she wants to be cryogenically frozen. I was like, really? And she goes, she's like kind of gazing out the window dreamily. She went, what could be better than being? <laughs> I was like, oh, God. What did your mom do uh, for like when you were a kid? She's um really smart and yeah you know she she did a couple of degrees later in life like like Egyptology and yeah but she she writes now she's writing all kinds of books that none of us have read and she's a mysterious enigma of a woman yeah it but she's doesn't surprise me yeah she raised us I guess that was her yeah yeah her thing if you wrote a, a movie that was your life what has been like the climactic turning point for you that changed your trajectory so much of, of my whole identity is tied up in what I do in my work and mm -hmm. in, in a way that's not healthy probably but so I would say probably when I was 11 and I went to Yuck Yucks and the headliner got me up on stage and made me be like a ventriloquist dummy and I and I loved it and uh mm -hmm. yeah I became yeah, first like last. deeply obsessed deeply yeah yeah so that do you remember who that was no it was some guy in a suit it was like yuck yucks guys and yeah. suits Love yeah it. what's something that people don't know about you uh, like I have a real problem with cutting my own hair as like an anxiety thing it's almost like oh. I imagine what like <laughs> like self-harm feel I'm not why I'm laughing your but hair like, self-harm yeah kind of like what if I'm anxious yeah. and it's it's like an, almost an unconscious thing I pick up the scissors I cut like the back of like I try to give myself a haircut and it's usually like it's sort of cyclical it's like once a month like hormonally something's going on I start kind of giving myself a haircut it's really weird because it's like mm. every month I throw the scissors out because I, I you can't cut the back of your own head no every month I fuck up my hair I, it becomes this sort of weird shameful private process though that I I mess up my hair and then I have to go get it fixed with the hairdresser and I, I go in and Debbie who's this hairdresser around the corner is like what have you done she's <laughs> she's like this <laughs> she sort of sounds like a Monty Python character of a woman you know like ah Oh my what have you done like that. yeah I love it I love that that'll go into feel good at some point it has to I love Debbie yeah what's something they haven't done I mean you said you want to write like a an album you want to make an album I'd love to just even make a song like even just record yeah. one song I love the idea of laying down the tracks like the the uh you know adding the layers of drums and that I, I just love to have a really well produced song that nobody ever hears but is just... that your piano behind you yeah, I have tons of instruments. Yeah. And I I like having friends around and, and playing. Yeah. yeah. I had no idea what a beautiful voice you had. I heard like one of your comedy songs and I was like, oh, oh no, you can no, sing. No, but no, you can no. sing. Thanks. No, it's you can very, sing. It's very nasal. It's I mean a bit muppety. I don't know. It didn't feel muppety to me. It felt true. Like it just felt like a well, Thanks. What's the worst advice or best advice you ever got? Worst advice is my mom said to me when I was about, yeah, I guess I was like 20 and I just moved, I was moving to England and I'd saved up a couple of grand or something. That's like, I think I, I didn't have, maybe I had a thousand dollars or something to move to England. And my mom, for some reason was like, be frivolous with money. And she said those words. She was like, yeah. you're not going to live forever. And, and she sort of always said that about money, just spend. Like if you're, you know, <laughs> and I don't know why she said that because, but our family's not good with money. And right. Yeah. Yeah. That so feels I wish like the best and worst advice. Yeah. Well, she always says like, if you're in an airport and you're about to go on a long flight and you're super stressed out, she's like, just spend the money, like buy a nice meal, get a glass of wine, go to the duty free, get some creams or something to, she's like, it's just, you, you know, you deserve it. But I do wish she had said, you know, <laughs> this is, how to cook. Pocket that. Instance, yeah, pocket that. <laughs> save that money. Yeah. yeah. Best advice is uh, Mark McKinney uh, from Kids in the Hall saying, yeah. before you go on stage, imagine you're going back on for your encore. You've already killed and they're, they're cheering because they want you to come back. I <laughs> love that so yeah. much. I really do do that. I, I, I really try to channel that specific energy. He came and taught Second City a workshop once and he gave us some good advice, which was like, hang out with your colleagues. Like, yeah. don't just hang out on stage. Make sure you're picking up your chemistry as you, uh, like, off stage too. Totally. Unless you're a 15-year-old girl. 
and they're and then, 30. And <laughs> yeah. then there's a slight pause that needs to happen. Uh-huh. And I got another Mark McKinney advice. I'll take it. I love that guy. He said, he looks at his thumbs before he goes on stage and says, I want nothing. He says it to his thumbs. I don't remember the reasoning, but I want nothing is pretty cool. We used to like, say going on for improv, let's go out and win a Tony or an Oscar. Like, or that's like, great. Definitely committing to everything 1000% is because there's nothing less attractive like we were saying than like trying to be cool or like people who are kind of like winking at the camera like I know this is shit no you gotta go out and be like I'm trying my best to you know yes even in acting like there's a wink you know like sometimes like I'll go I know we're just make-believing I know as opposed to no this act this character is actually me I'm gonna commit to like yeah finding my connections that's my favorite type of improv too like playing the truth of some ridiculous situation yeah like you know like Darth Vader tells you that I don't know your brother's dead or something and you're like really play that moment yeah that's yeah. a bad example but like no no exactly though yeah. like if you have like two aliens having a discussion yeah. and one of the aliens goes I, I have alien cancer like yeah. treat it like it's actually like it's so Cry. delicious yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah that'll be our first scene when we improvise together alien two aliens cancer. discussing their alien cancer yeah <laughs> I'm afraid to tell you you have alien cancer yeah. <laughs> do you have any mistakes in your past that you're like that was a good one I oh my god so many I don't I know mean, where to start with that yeah yeah god like too many but see like your many. mistakes become like success because they come become comedy yeah, but there's still collateral damage I get it. <laughs> from, the, from the actual mistake. Yeah, you're right. Every time I'm thinking of one, I'm like, oh, yeah, but I wouldn't be who I am without that mistake. But, I love that answer, though. But I definitely one time thought someone was heckling me and they were deaf and I thought they were drunk <laughs> and really shouting at me, making these noises. Mm-hmm. And I stopped the show. I was like, hey, man, <laughs> you got to leave everyone else knew what was happening I did the same thing once where I thought someone had brought like a like a scooter in like that like that you would zoom down but they were in a wheelchair but I was I I couldn't see it was dark and I was being like hey did you bring your scooter what's with that like oh man I mean things like that just haunt me every night I go through a little Rolodex of those (laughs) I got the one where I was teaching an improv class and I can barely say this I was like (laughs) all right let's warm up everybody on their feet realizing that like majority in wheelchairs oh my beg your pardon. god beg your pardon just as you were as you were. <laughs> as you were not necessary who's a firecracker you, you I mean we've spoken about Coco and uh, Carolyn Taylor but uh, do you have anybody else that you want to shine a light on yeah Carolyn Taylor for sure and then yeah. maybe my grandma she was a real uh rebel yeah she was an agent in the UK and she was like a talent agent yeah like an agent for actors she was super ambitious and bold and uh she had her own agency and stuff at a time when no women did and like built this agency up and uh but she was like a polarizing person like still people in the industry remember how difficult she was she worked uh until she was 89 as an agent and like lying about her age no one knew her real age she was just outrageous she was like full of sexual innuendo and she was like very into men like at her funeral one of her clients was like a I thought she was like 70 I didn't know she was 89 and she was still my agent and that's worrying and b she was like every time I went into her office she was breaking up with someone on the phone (laughs) she was being like I can't see you anymore goodbye and hanging out like (laughs) but she was just wild and recognized like a kindred rebellious spirit in me and we had like a a very wry dynamic and bond and yeah she was cool what was her name Roz Chatto. Of course it was. Roz. Yeah, and she just, Come on. yeah, Roz. Yeah. This is what I picture, like always hair done. Always, always perfectly done up. Yeah. Beautiful kind of silk scarves. When I moved to England, right away she got really, really sick. And and so I became her carer like the first few years I was in England. She was and then she died. But luckily I had this time with her where wow. I was over there a lot. And so one night I had to call an ambulance for her. And we're in the ambulance and she's like really on death's door and then she and she's like indicating like she needs to say something urgently and we're like what what is it what is it and like takes the oxygen mask off and then she's like darling tell them about your comedy <laughs> like, to the, like to the nurse like she's still being an agent and trying to get me to tell everyone that I do comedy in the 
<laughs> oh or like, my god we'd go out for dinner and I'd be like please don't make me sing at the dinner when I was like 10 she'd be like of course I want and then at the dinner she'd be like may I sing a song and I'd like just always trying to get me to yeah there's a whole show around her oh my yeah, god yeah. what a fantastic person she was like a caricature of an agent in a way but yeah so yeah. so great and how lucky Honestly. to have like a chunk of time hey before like totally that's, that's good universe work totally yeah totally. yeah final question was advice advice that you would have given your younger may martin I, I would have been like don't be in such a big hurry to be an adult because you're not you know that mm -hmm. yeah i would have been like yeah you have interests in adult things and you're doing cool things but uh yeah you're not emotionally there yet I think I was, mm -hmm. I was in such a hurry yeah honestly I don't want to say goodbye I want to just fill up our teacups and come back and then hang yeah, out longer I'm I think you're such a special person I really thanks do. you mm -hmm. too it's so good to see your face and yeah. yeah thank you so much I was really yeah I was nervous for some reason but it was so nice to talk me too and I'm so thrilled like this is our We've been doing this for 150 episodes, so it's really wow. extraordinary that you're going to be our 150th. That's a big accomplishment. That's a ton of work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, I barely do anything. I chat for a bit, but like Winnie and her team, they're yeah. like killing it. So, yeah. Wow. yeah. Wow. Do you love doing it? Well, I do love this. Like I love connecting. I love having an, op an opportunity to have like not surface conversations because I feel like when you put yourself in this position, you get like, oh, we're actually going to have a deep chat so if I talk to you about yeah. like your dreams and stuff it's like this is something that we know is going to come up yeah as opposed yeah. to like in passing like, oh Naomi <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. hey how are your dreams going May? okay yeah. see you later yeah that's not <laughs> as cool but so I love that and um it's also like you know that people maybe get to know folks on a deeper level is exciting to me yeah so somebody like you that people go oh yeah I know Maymar and but then they might discover like this whole other aspect which is which is cool that's cool i adore you and i can't wait to see you bye bye you too you're a gem Mwah. thank you i mean there's part of me that is like that's oh, may oh it's it's may my buddy may i remember may and then there's part of me that's like oh my god i can't believe i got to chat with may martin I can't believe it. And then I can't believe also that they were our 150th guest. It's the perfect thing, right? Isn't that so cool? You're welcome. I remember talking with Winnie and and she said, you know, we've got our 150th episode. It'd be great to have somebody that turns it up a notch. And then I was like, I'm gonna reach out to May. I mean, they're probably super busy. And unless I can record while they are flying from one place to another, it's not gonna happen. And suddenly it, it was possible. And we just had a great chat. Left me wanting more May. It left me thinking, I think I should travel over to the UK and do some improv with May. That's what I really want to do. So hear that universe, make that happen, would you? Now for all those firecrackers in Los Angeles, New York, and Toronto, May will be doing select dates in your fair cities. I know, is that fun? They're on tour. So on May 7th, 2022, May will be at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. It's the Greek theater. Have you ever been there before? It's amazing. I used to live like right down the street from it. If you're in LA, you just gotta go. You just gotta go. And then May 8th, May will be at the Bourbon Room in LA. And on May 11th at the Town Hall in New York. On May 20th at the Danforth Music Hall in Toronto. That's a great lineup. Grateful Dead followers are like deadheads. Justin Bieber's are the believers. What are you if you're like a May Martin fan? Are you a May Martini? Um, May Martians? The May Martinites? Martinites? I mean, maybe it's the May Martians. I'm kind of digging that. I'll have to check in with May. Tickets are on sale for their tour, and we've got you in our show notes if you want more information. For the latest updates with May, follow them on Twitter at the May Martin or on Instagram at Hooray May, or go to their website, MayMartin.net. And now we have a treat. I mean, isn't it always a treat? That's what you're thinking. You're like, every firecracker episode, I get to meet a new firecracker in the world. It's all a treat. But next week, I'll be chatting with producer and executive producer, Teresa M. Ho. She's produced amazing shows like CBC Frankie Drake Mysteries 
and Murdoch Mysteries, and the recently launched CBC Gem original Hello Again, created by Simu Liu and Firecracker Natalie Younglai. Oh, I love Natalie Younglai. If you haven't heard her episode, go on, go check it out. I'm so jazzed to be sharing my Teresa chat with you all next week. And like we always say, there's always a seat for you at the Firecracker table because our table just has many, many leaves and many, many great snacks. So many gummy bears and cheesies. Gummy bears, cheesies, box of white wine. It's your ticket to happiness. And you know what else is your ticket to happiness? Firecracker department. You know, you're not in this journey by yourself. You need fuel to keep your creative action going. So pull up a chair, tell us what you're working on, and then, you know, tell us how we can help. Drop us a comment in our socials, Firecracker D-E-P-T, or send me an email at firecrackerdepartment at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Every time I get any note from any of you, I share it with the entire team, and I have to say, it just lifts everybody's spirits so much. Because, you know, these podcasts, you sit in your little studio. <laughs> I don't have a studio. I'm at my desk in my house. One day we'll have a studio, but look, you put these podcasts out there, and so when we hear back from you, it's so amazing. It really makes our day. To see what we have going on, go over to our website, firecrackdepartment.com. And while you're there, if you haven't already, subscribe to our monthly newsletter to get the inside track on everything that's going on in Firecracker Department world. There's something for everybody, like writing bursts, brunches, mentorship workshops, uh, mini wellness moments. We have social justice workshops, script readings. I mean, as I said, there's something for everybody. What, what is that that you said you want? Oh, you want a monthly blog post? Yeah, we've got that too. So I'm telling you, something for everybody. Pull up a chair and join us for any of these events. And we have all these events organized in our handy dandy event calendar on our website. So go check that out. Plug yourself in some firecracker events and come along for the ride. Thanks for joining me today. I know there's a lot to listen to. I know you got a lot going on. And I sure appreciate you joining me today. I'm Naomi and this has been the firecracker department. Go on out there. Take some creative action, why don't you? Winnie Wong is our Firecracker head producer. Follow her at wonder underscore Wong on Instagram and wonder underscore Wong 8 on Twitter. This episode is edited by Shane Stoltz. You can follow them at Shane Stoltz, all one word, and Shane with a Y. This intro was written by the one and only wonderful Winnie Wong. That's right, she's a triple W. The rest of the team comes at you from Toronto, Los Angeles, Austin, London, Dubai, and truly from all over the world. Thanks also to Jeff Malutinovic and Igor Korea for our theme music and... Thanks to you, yeah, you, sitting there, driving there, walking there, working out there, and taking time to listen. We know there's a lot of options out there, and we really appreciate you choosing us. We hope to see you at maybe brunch, maybe the writing workshop, and until next time, thank you for listening to the Firecracker Department. We'll see you next time. Firecracker.